योग कर्मसु कौशल हेलो एवरीवन आई एम डॉक्टर पूर्वी पुजारी प्रोफेसर ऑफ इकोनॉमिक्स एट विजय पाटिल स्कूल ऑफ मैनेजमेंट डी वाई पाटिल यूनिवर्सिटी नवी मुंबई महाराष्ट्र आई थैंक यू जी सी ह्यूमन रिसोर्स डेवलपमेंट सेंटर ऑफ गुजरात यूनिवर्सिटी फॉर गिविंग मी एन अपॉर्चुनिटी टू कनेक्ट विद यू ऑल एल डिलीवर माई सेशन ऑन डिमांड एनालिसिस I thank Professor Dr. Jagdish Joshi, Professor and Director of UGC HRDC of Gujarat University. I should really appreciate the work done by the university in terms of online teaching and refresher courses. It has been a wonderful inter- interacting with them and collaborating with them. It uh, this university has first ever online short term course on e-content development during the lockdown. and unlock one more than 100 courses with about 4000 participants uh, have successfully completed this course and these participants are from across the country uh, the university also had first online professional development program for the administrative staff of universities during lockdown with 105 participants i have seen the website of the university uh, ugc hrdc gu it's very dynamic and uh, i'm i've come to know that they invite lots of international resource persons they have mou with uk and canadian university and they provide consultancy as well i'm very proud and honored to be a part of their initiative uh, in this session i'll be talking about demand analysis which is a very integral part of managerial economics in demand analysis we'll be studying about how the demand for a particular good or service is um, uh, understood what are the aspects of it what is the basic definition of demand i'll be talking about demand curve demand schedule determinants of demand law of demand and exceptions to law of demand in the subsequent section i will be also talking about elasticity of demand i'll be talking about price elasticity of demand advertisement elasticity of demand cross elasticity of demand and income elasticity of demand this particular session would be helpful for anybody who wants to understand economics from the basics concept uh, the basic concepts of economics and they would also be able to understand what is the utilization of these economic concepts in terms of analysis of demand from the producer as well as the consumer's point of view we will be talking about demand analysis demand is important from the price perspective inventory control perspective and for the profit analysis of any producer so demand is a very important concept of managerial economics and from the consumer's point of view also they would like to know what is the demand for a particular product or service in the market so we'll start with the definition of demand by demand we mean the various quantities of a given commodity or service which consumers will buy in one market in a given period of time at various prices etc etc purpose so let me explain that when we talk about demand we always talk about the quantity demanded so demand is not complete unless we understand that what is the quantity demanded of a product or a service So let's assume I am trying to understand the demand for tomatoes in a market. I would like to understand what is the quantity demanded for tomatoes in that market. When I say market, I have to be very clear that market for me means could be the local vegetable farmers market, or it could be an online market. I could be ordering my groceries online, or it could be. any given market wherever like share market wherever the exchange of goods and services are happening then we also talk about the time period for any given period what is the quantity demanded is what producers would be interested in knowing so whether the quantity demanded is for a week for a day or for a month or a complete year that specifics have to be given whenever we are defining demand for a producer it's very important to know what is the demand for his product in a week or a month that specification has to go next is what are the prices price is one of the most important determinant of demand in the short term 
and we any producer would like to know what are the implications of change in demand when there is a change in price so when the prices of tomatoes let's assume is 20 rupees per kg what would be the weekly demand and when the prices of tomatoes are 150 rupees per kg what would be the weekly demand so again demand definition has to specify the quantity demanded market in which market whether it's an online market or an offline market what is the time period and what are the prices so demand definition has to have these four qualities entities defined Along with that, we also use a Latin term, which is known as satris paribus, which means all other things remaining equal. So there is no change in, let's say, fashion, trends, regulatory policies. So all other environmental factors are considered normal, constant as given. There are some prerequisites, requisites for the demand to take place. One is desire for a specific commodity. So desire from the consumer side is very, very important. Second is sufficient resources to purchase the desired commodity. So the, we are assuming that consumer would have sufficient resources to buy that commodity. Next is willingness to spend the resources. Though the per, per consumer might be having a desire, whether he is willing to spend that money in that particular time period is again a requisite. So when there is a desire, when there are resources, ability to pay, as well as willingness to pay, these three things are there, then we can assume that demand would take place. Along with that, the availability of the commodity at a certain price, at a certain place, and certain time is again very important. So in economics, we understand demand is the various quantities of a commodity or service which consumers will buy in a market in a given period of time at various prices, all other things remaining the same. Now, we also understand that demand schedule has to be specified, which is a tabular presentation of different prices of a commodity and its corresponding quantity demanded per unit of time. So here on the screen, you can see that, uh, let's assume these are shirt prices at 800 rupees, 8,000 shirts are demanded in a month at 600 price rupees 600 15 shirts or uh, 15000 shirts are demanded quantity are bought and at the price of 400 30000 shirts are being bought in that market now as you see as the price is coming down the quantity demanded is going up which is a natural human tendency we'll talk about it later also in the ppt in the lecture that as the prices go down in the demand schedule, we can see that quantities demanded are going up. The number of shirts being bought in that market is going up. So a demand schedule is basically a presentation of prices as well as corresponding quantities being bought in that market. Next, we go to demand function. Demand function states the relationship between demand for a product which is a dependent variable and it determines the independent variable. Later in lecture, we'll be understanding different kinds of demand determinants. So demand is dependent on uh, initially, we can say first thing is price, second is income, third is price of corresponding commodities. So there are various things which impact the demand for any good or service. So here in this particular slide, you can see that dx is the demand for the commodity x, which is a dependent variable. Price of a commodity uh, is uh, denoted by px. I is the consumer's income. Py is the price of related goods. And t is the taste of the consumer, the independent variables. So all the functions in the function, all the right hand entities are independent, whereas demand would be dependent on this. When we present this relationship, this is known as demand function. Next, we go to demand curve. A demand curve is a graphical representation of the demand schedule. It is obtained by plotting the demand schedule. In that curve, you can see that there are various quantities at various prices. So if you see the curve, it is a downward sloping curve. So DD is your demand curve. And on the x-axis are the quantity demanded. And on the y-axis, we have price. 
So at different prices, the corresponding quantity demanded are plotted in the demand curve. And we get a downward sloping from left to right. The law of demand states that demand curves are negatively slow. There are changes in quantity demanded when there is a change in price and it is known as movement along the demand curve. So when the quantity changes as per the price changes, we call it movement along the demand curve. When the changes in demand are due to variables except prices, apart from prices, we call it shift in the demand curve, which is like rightward or leftward. We'll be understanding this in detail once we go ahead in the lecture. Now, the first thing which I would like to explain here is why demand curve slopes downwards or cause of demand curve sloping of demand curve. First is income effect. When the price of a commodity falls, the consumer can buy more quantities of that commodity with his given income. So suppose you are going to the market and trying to buy tomatoes Initially, you thought the price would be 50 rupees per kg. When you go to the market, it's 25 rupees per kg. Now you feel that you have become rich. This is known as you feel that your real income has gone up. And that is the impact of income effect. That is known as income effect, where you tend to buy more of a commodity because that commodity has become cheaper. So whenever the price goes down, the consumer feels that his real income has gone up and with the, in the given income, in the given salary, he can buy more of some commodities. That is known as income effect uh, of in demand. Next is substitution effect. A fall in the price of a good with the price of its substitute remaining the same will make it attractive to the buyer to buy that commodity. So usually when we tend to have a reduction in the price, we tend to buy more of a commodity because we think that we can substitute more of that commodity compared to the higher priced substitutes. So we tend to substitute the commodity that is known as substitution effect. Next, I would like to explain the types of demand as per the goods categorization. In, uh, in economics, in demand analysis, we use many terms. So here I would like to explain each of these terms. First is normal good. When an increase in income causes an increase in demand, we call that particular good as a normal good. Most of the goods which we buy from FMCG industry, like let's say toothpaste, clothes, shoes, accessories, are the normal good. And how do we understand that they are normal good? Whenever there is a rise in income, we tend to buy these commodities in more number. So whenever a consumer's income increases, they tend to spend more on groceries, clothes, shoes, etc. That these all these goods are normal goods. Next is inferior goods. When an increase in income causes a decrease in demand, we consider these goods as inferior goods. In our life, we have lots of commodities, goods or services which we tend to re reduce the consumption when our income increases. For example, if you are using a state transport bus on, or a normal bus to commute to your office or your educational institute, you might start using a cab or a taxi service. So for you, for that particular consumer, the state transport bus would be an inferior good. So for, from a producer point of view, he would like to know which are the commodities where the consumer would reduce its quantity purchased when the consumer's income goes up. That is, these goods are known as inferior goods. Then we also use the term substitute goods a lot. Two goods are substitutes. If an increase in price of one of them causes an increase in demand for the other, thus an increase in price of coffee would increase the demand for tea if the goods were substitutes. In our life, there are many commodities which we use against each other, use each of them in the in place of each other. These uh, sub, uh, products are known as substitute goods. When price of one of such commodity increases, we very easily shift to the other commodity, which is known as a substitute good. From producer point of view, you would like to know which are the products which are used in substitution of my particular product. So when price of, let's say, pizza uh, in a fast food chain goes up, which are the other products which consumers 
switch to. So it could be burgers, it could be wraps. So from a producer point of view, the understanding the products are which products are substitute to one another is very, very important. One of the similar concept is complementary products. Two goods are known as complementary products if an increase in price of another would decrease the demand for another. Example here would be printer and cartridge. In cartridge, it could be car and petrol. So increase in price of printer would decrease the demand for ink cartridge if these goods were complements. So complementary goods are products which are used together and they are required to be used together. So for example, printer and ink cartridge. So whenever the price of printer goes up, definitely we can assume that price of uh, quantity demanded of printers would go down and subsequently the ink cartridges demand would also go down. So these are the four concepts uh, I wanted to explain here. Normal goods, inferior goods, substitutes and complements. Now we go to a very important concept in demand analysis, which is the law of demand. Law of demand describes the general tendency of consumers' behavior. The law of demand states that other factors being constant, such as paribus, price and quantity demanded of any good and service are inversely related to each other. When the price of a product increases, the demand for the same product will fall. So whenever price of a commodity increases, the consumer tends to spend much less on the quantity of that particular good. So price of any good goes up, the quantity purchased for that commodity would go down. That is the law of demand. The chief characteristics of law of demand is the inverse relationship between price and quantity, where price is the independent variable and quantity demanded is the dependent variable. The impact is due to the income effect and the substitution effect, which we studied earlier. There are some assumptions with the law of demand. There is no change in taste and preference of the consumer. So when the prices go up, the taste and preference of the consumer would remain the same. Consumer's income remain the same. So because we are understanding the correlation between price and quantity demanded, we are assuming that consumer's income, meanwhile, would remain the same. The price of the related commodities, which can be understood as substitute and complements, should not change. The commodity should be a normal commodity. So here also, there are some exceptions to the law of demand, which we understand. Now we talk about other determinants of market demand. In other determinants, the first one is price of substitutes. So for example, when we are trying to understand the price of tea, we are trying to understand the quantity demanded for uh, tea, then the price of coffee would be a very important constituent because coffee is considered to be a close substitute of tea. So when quantity demanded of tea is in consideration and the price of coffee goes down, definitely the quantity demanded for coffee would go up, which would eventually impact the demand for tea. So most of the tea lovers, which might be shifting to drinking of coffee, and there would be a decrease in the demand for quantity demanded of tea. Next is price of complementary goods. When we talk about complementary goods, then we can talk about automobile and petrol and diesel. So for a car, uh, running with petrol, petrol would be a complementary good. So if there is a reduction in price of, let's say, petrol, there would be a huge impact on the quantity demanded of car and vice versa. If the car prices go down, definitely number of consumers who would be buying cars would increase and there would be an increase in demand of petrol as well. So we can assume, we can understand that price of complementary goods is also a very important determinant of market demand. Next, we talk about consumer's income. In terms of consumer income, we, underst we can understand this from three perspectives. The goods can be divided into essential consumer goods, normal goods, or luxury goods. In essential consumer goods, we can talk about normal groceries. So in terms of essential con consumer goods, 
if the income goes up, there would be some impact on the quantity demanded. But we, when we talk about normal goods, they are hugely impacted by the increase in the consumer income. If there is a change in consumer income, if the consumer income goes up, the consumer tend to buy more of normal goods, which can be considered as apparels or education. So all these things would, the quantity demanded would go up when there is an increase in consumer income. And this would also go down when there is a decrease in consumer's income. Then we talk about luxury goods. Luxury goods are deeply impacted by, so luxury goods are deeply impacted by their consumer's income. When the price income goes up, the consumer income goes up, the quantity demanded of luxury goods also goes up. Next, we talk about the consumer's taste and preferences. In consumer's taste and preferences, if in general in an, in an economy, consumers are preferring to buy organic food products, there would be an increase in demand for such commodities. So consumers preference or not having some preference for a particular good would also impact the quantity demanded for that commodity. If in general, the taste and preference are shifting towards, let's say, organic foods or fast foods in an economy, definitely the quantity demanded of those goods and services would go up. Next is advertisement of the product. So advertisement of the product is again hugely impacted, uh, hugely impacts the demand for that commodity. We can see that trend in the FMCG product, higher the and more the advertisements uh, or more the promotional campaigns for such products, definitely there is an increase in demand. So when we talk about when we talk about discounts and free gifts, most of the price sensitive consumers would change their quantity demanded if there is availability of some uh, price discounts or free gifts with the commodity. For example, if you are buying a washing machine and if there is a brand which is offering a free iron or a free detergent powder, then there would be some consumers who would be switching the brands. Similarly, if there are some sale discounts available, buy one, get one free, that also impacts the quantity demanded of those commodities. Then is number of uses of commodity. Here I would like to take example of milk. In most of the household, milk is used for direct consumption by kids as well as adults. And then it is also used for preparation of tea or coffee or making of curd or yogurt or sweet dishes or with breakfast cereal. So number of uses, more the number of uses of that commodity, more would be the quantity demanded. Higher the number of uses, higher would be the quantity demanded. One more good example here could be electricity. So electricity is used in most of the households for switching, uh, for using with uh, air conditioning, for washing machines, for dishwashers, for charging the mobile phones. So as we see over the period of time, the number of uses of electricity has gone up as well as the quantity demanded of electricity has gone up. Next, we talk about competition. Competition also impacts the quantity demanded of any commodity. So prevalence of a uh, number of competitors in a market usually impacts the quantity demanded. And that is why we consider competition as a determinant of market demand. Next, we come to fashion and fads. If any particular commodity is trending, is in fashion, let's assume that a celebrity has endorsed some particular product or service or in a movie, they have used some particular apparel or commodity uh, accessories, then these particular things come in fashion or, or are trending. So we see more consumption of such products and definitely there is an increase in demand for those commodities. Then we talk about the consumer credit facility. Better availability of consumer credit facility or the loans for a buying of purchase of any good or service would increase the quantity demanded. For example, if there are educational loans available, the consumers would be going for higher education, more in numbers. Similarly, if in, in any area that consumer credit facility is available for buying of gold or buying of vehicles, there would be an increase in quantity demanded for that particular product. 
Next, we come to population of the country. Higher the demographic population of a particular consumer segment, higher would be the quantity demanded for the related good and service. So if in any uh, country, in an, in an economy, there are large number of younger kids, small kids, then the demand for education as well as demand for toys or bicycles could be more. So population of the country is very important in understanding the total demand for any commodity. Next, we come to demographic details. Demographic details. So for any producer, it is very important to understand is the target segment available in that particular market or not? So if I am producing a commodity which is for old age people, then I would like to understand what is the number of people in that particular age group. So in demographic details, we talk about gender, we talk about age group, we also talk about income, occupation, and education level of that particular segment. So demographic details would also impact the demand for a commodity. So when any producer is selling uh, in the market, they would like to understand how many people are from that particular demographic group. Next is distribution pattern of national income. Better balanced distribution pattern of national income would give increased the quantity demanded of most of the FMCG product or fast food product. So distribution pattern of national income is again a very important market determinant for understanding the quantity demanded. Next is lifestyle and standard of living. There are many products which are directly impacted by the standard of living in an economy. For example, the demand for air conditioners, demand for dishwashers would be hugely impacted by the standard of living or the lifestyle. In an economy or in a market, if most of the consumers prefer good public transport, which is available, then the demand for vehicles would be less. If in general, the lifestyle is that people prefer having their own personal uh, vehicles, then the demand for the vehicles would be more. Then there is awareness or education. What is the education level of the consumers as well as what is the awareness about a particular good would also impact the quantity demanded for that particular good. In an economy, if people are not aware about the utility of dishwashers, let's assume, then there would be less quantity demanded for dishwashers in that particular economy. Next, we go to exceptions to law of demand. There are lots of exceptions to law of demand. First, I would like to state here the law of demand states that that when price of a commodity goes up, the quantity demanded goes down. So higher the price of a particular product, the quantity demanded for that particular product would be lower. The first exception here is inferior goods. Inferior goods we have defined as these are the products where when the consumer income goes up, the consumer tends to buy less of those commodities because he considers them as inferior. So when the price of, let's say, such inferior goods goes up, the quantity demanded you won't go down and there would be a different, this would be considered an exception to the law of demand. Most of the inferior products, when the prices go down, then there won't be an increase in those commodities being purchased more. Second is status goods, which are also known as demonstration goods or pebbling goods. These demonstration goods, diamonds or luxury cars are being bought because they are high priced. So definitely higher the price of these commodities, more will be the purchase of these commodities. In case of these goods, when the prices go down, people do not tend to uh, buy more of these commodities because in that case, so we'll talk about the status goods. Most of these goods are used for showing off the status, demonstrating uh, status, and also known as weblen goods. So when prices of these products go down, for example, if the prices of diamonds go down, definitely they are no more a status symbol. So consumers tend to buy them less. That is why we call them as an exception to law of demand. Next is expectations regarding future prices. Here I would like to take examples of shares and goals. The law of demand states that whenever prices are going up, 
the quantity demanded for that commodity goes up, goes down. So definitely in terms of gold, when the prices go up, there would be an expectation that prices would be going up in future as well. So people tend to still buy the gold, which we uh, they require, let's say, for a wedding or some other purposes. In terms of shares, if the prices are go down, people do not buy more of shares. Sometimes they want to hold on to their purchases in the presumption that there would be more decrease in the price of goods, price of shares. So in future, because they expect that in future there would be a decrease in demand, a decrease in prices of the shares, definitely there would be a decrease in quantity demanded for the time being. Here also I would like to understand, like to explain the expectations regarding future prices because sometimes when the prices are go going down, the consumer hold on to their purchases assuming that prices are going to go down further more and then they would increase their demand. So they hold on to their purchases till they feel that prices are maybe will be lower next day on. So they hold on to their purchases. Next is emergencies. In case of emergencies, most of the time we do not consider the price and we do not reduce our demand because this is an emergency situation. We continue with the purchase, even the prices have gone up. So in times of COVID-19, we saw that in terms of oxygen cylinder, even though the prices are going up because it was an emergency health situation, consumer was still going and buying the oxygen cylinders and uh, life-saving drugs. So these are the exceptions to law of demand. Then we talk about quality price relationship. There are some products where the assumption that higher the price of the commodity, higher would be the quality of that particular product. So for example, in cosmetics, most of the consumers feel that higher the price of the cosmetics, higher is the quality. So again, exception, this would be an exception to law of demand. So with the higher prices, the quantity demanded does not go down. In fact, it keeps going up. Next is distinct necessities. There are some necessities in our life which we keep consuming even though the prices go up. Our quantity demanded does not go down. We can say in terms of electricity, in terms of essential consumer goods, the, these distinct necessities are so specific that we do not reduce our demand even though the prices are going up. That is why they are considered as an exception to law of demand. Last is ignorance. Sometimes we are ignorant to the price changes. Sometimes the consumer does not uh, is not aware the prices have changed. And that is why they keep consuming the product. The quantity demanded does not go down even with an increase in price because of consumer being unaware of such price changes. That would also be an exception to law of demand. Now, there is one more exception to law of demand. This category of goods are known as Giffen goods. This was given by a Scottish economist, Sir Robert Giffen. Sir Robert said that it is a paradox that the purchasing habit of some inferior commodities in the poor households, which is an essential commodity. So for example, if a low income household or community is having potatoes and meat, and if they have, if the prices of potatoes go up, these communities reduce the consumption of meat to save money for price, which is their essential staple diet. So this is a given paradox where the prices of potatoes have gone up. Still, the consumption of potatoes remains the same, does not go down. In fact, the potatoes are substituted in place of meat. So consumption of meat goes down and consumption of potatoes stays the same or goes up. This paradox is known as Giffen paradox because it was first noticed by a Scottish economist, Sir Robert Giffen. The basic requirement for Giffen good is these, these goods should be from an inferior uh, goods category. They should be consumed by low income households as well as they should be a staple essential commodity. Next, we understand the change in quantity demanded, which is movement along the demand curve. A movement along the demand curve is caused by a change in price of goods only other thing, only if other things remaining the constant. It is also known as change in quantity demanded of the good. Movement is along the same demand curve. 
it could be expansion of demand or contraction of demand. When there is a rise in the quantity demanded of a product with a fall in the price of that particular commodity, we call it expansion of demand. When there is a fall in demand, there is a decrease in quantity demanded with a rise in price of good that is known as contraction of demand. So I'll repeat, expansion and contraction of demand happen along the same demand curve whenever there is a change in the price. So price changes are, are result into movement along the same demand curve. Next, we understand the concept of shift in demand curve. Shift in demand curve, whenever we move the demand curve to the right or to the left due to an increase or decrease in the quantity demanded from the factors apart from price. Whenever there is a shift in demand curve towards the right or towards the left due to factors apart from price, that is known as shift in demand curve. So taste and preferences, for example, the price of any particular commodity remains the same, but slowly, gradually, the consumers have shifted their preference towards that particular product, then the demand curve would move towards the right. So here we can see the demand curve D1, D1 would show there is an increase in the quantity demanded of that commodity, though the price have remained the same. Similarly, if the consumer income is also an important market determinant of quantity demanded, if the consumer income goes down, even at the, if the price remains the same, the quantity demanded for that particular commodity will come down and the demand curve will shift towards left, which is D2, D2. So quantity demanded has gone down with, uh, with a shift, a change in the consumer's income. Next is price of substitutes and complements. If there is a change in price of substitute, the price goes down of the substitute, then quantity demanded of the price commodity X will go down and there will be a shift towards the left. So we understand here that whenever there is a change in demand due to determinant other than price, we call it a shift in demand curve. Now in the next session, we'll be discussing the elasticities of demand. Elasticity of demand is basically the responsiveness or sensitive of demand uh, in respect to the changes in any of its determinants. This particular concept is used by all the producers to understand what will be the impact on the total revenue whenever there is a change in, let's say, price or advertisement. So a concept of price elasticity is used in understanding what should be the, when the sale should be there for the commodities, whether uh, it will benefit for the producer to increase the price or decrease the price. This concept is also used while taxation of the commodities. It is also used when we go to an entertainment park and the food prices and the water bottle prices are a little higher on the terms. We are inelastic with our demand. So that is why the prices can be, can be raised and still the consumer will have an inelastic demand. So elasticity is used in multiple areas of our daily lives. Whenever we are booking our tickets, railway tickets on Tatkal or when we are booking our airline tickets around holidays, whether we are elastic or inelastic with our demand would allow the producer to understand how the price changes can be in effect. So let's start with elasticities of demand. Next, we understand a very important concept which is known as elasticity of demand. Elasticity of demand is the measure of responsiveness of demand for a commodity to the change in any of its determinant. So this is the responsiveness or sensitiveness of demand for a commodity to the changes in any of determinant, price, cross, advertisement, and income. Mostly when we talk about price uh, elasticity, this is one of the most important type of elasticity of demand. So price elasticity of demand is degree of responsiveness or sensitiveness of demand for a commodity, for a change in its price, 
So formula for this price elasticity is on the numerator, we have percentage change in quantity demanded. And in the denominator, we have percentage change in price. I repeat, price elasticity is a measure of how the consumers react with the changes in price. Here I would like to explain, there are some products like clothes where we are very receptive or very sensitive to the changes in price. Whereas there are some products like salt where we are not very responsive or sensitive to the changes in price. So price elasticity or elasticity in general is a measurement of how, what is the reaction of the consumer when there is a change in any of its determinant. Here we would like to discuss the price elasticity which measures the reaction or the response of the consumer, how sensitive we are to the changes in price to the and, and re reflect it in the quantity demanded. So demand is said to be elastic if the quantity demanded changes by a lot when the price changes even a little. Here we consider the price elasticity is greater than one. I'll repeat again, if the quantity demanded is impacted hugely by changes in price, we call that product demand as elastic demand. Examples could be gold or share prices. We are very elastic with our demand. Whenever there is a price change, we change the quantity demanded to a large extent. A small um, change in the share prices would turn into a huge quantity demanded impact. Demand is said to be inelastic if the quantity changes by very little, even if the price changes a lot. So a 10% change in demand would result in very minimal or 1% or 2% change in quantity demanded. Then we consider that particular commodity as in having an inelastic demand. Here the examples are usually taken as salt. So even if there is a reduction in the price of salt, the consumer usually do not go and buy more of that commodity, that is salt in this case. So price of uh, demand for salt is considered to be inelastic. Demand is said to be unit elastic if the quantity changes by the same amount as the price change. Here we can take example of stationery or apparels. So, if the change in price is equivalent to the change in quantity demanded, we call it as a unit elastic demand. The price elasticity formula, as was given in the last slide, is percentage change in quantity demanded divided by percentage change in price. If the answer is between 0 and minus 1, the relationship is inelastic. If the answer is between minus 1 and infinity, the relationship is elastic. According to the law of demand, whenever the price rises, the quantity demanded falls. So the price elasticity is always negative because out of numerator and denominator, each one of them are moving in different directions. So definitely the answer would be always negative. So economists many times usually stated without sign also, but uh, price elasticity is always negative for the normal goods. So how do we constitute that as price elasticity and expenditure? How do we correlate them? If the demand is elastic, quantity demanded is highly responsive to price changes. So quantity demanded would impact, would be impacted, the consumer would be sensitive to the changes in price. The percentage change in the quantity would be dominating the equation. So percentage change in quantity would be more or less assume for a price change of 10%, the quantity changed would be, a for, there could be a 40% change in the quantity demanded. We consider that particular product as elastic. An increase in price will reduce the total expenditure because the total expenditure is price into quantity. Definitely an increase in price would reduce the quantity demanded to a large extent definitely the total expenditure would reduce. And decrease in price will increase the total expenditure. So whenever there is a price decrease, definitely the quantity demanded would be a lot.
So we, here we are trying to understand the difference, uh, the reaction of price elastic relation of the price elasticity and the total expenditure. If the demand is inelastic, quantity demanded is not very responsive to price changes. That is the basic definition. Percentage change in price dominates. So an increase in price will increase the total expenditure because the quantity demanded is not having much of a reaction. So for a 10% change in price, the quantity demanded would be impacted only, let's assume, say, by 4%. There would be a reduction only by 4%. So the price change will dominate the formula and the reaction would be a reduction, uh, an increase in total expenditure. A decrease in price would decrease the total expenditure because the here again the price because it's an inelastic product, the decrease in price do not have much impact, does not have much impact on the quantity demanded. So the total expenditure would be a lesser number reduction with the decrease in price. What are the determinants of elasticity? How do we understand that? What are the important aspects of whether a product, particular product is elastic or not? First is substitution possibilities. The price elasticity of demand will be relatively high if it is easy to substitute between products. If, the, if we consider tea and coffee as close substitutes, the price elasticity of tea would be very high because uh, whenever the price of tea goes up, the consumer would very easily switch to coffee. Whenever the price of coffee goes up, the most of the consumer would very easily switch to tea. So there is a high substitution possibility. So quantity demanded would be very sensitive to the price changes. That is how we understand whether a particular product is elastic or not. Next is the budget share. The larger the share of the budget, the good uses tends to have higher price elasticity of demand. So when suppose I'm buying a real estate, I'm buying an apartment because it is a huge amount of my budget going up, out, definitely I would be very elastic. I would be very sensitive to the changes in price. If something which is very insignificant, I'm buying a candy, which is just, let's say, one rupees, a very less amount, definitely my demand would be inelastic. So what is the budget share of the price of that commodity would hugely impact the elasticity of demand for that particular commodity. So in case of candy, I won't be very elastic. I would be inelastic because I do not consider a 10% change in price to have an impact on the change in the quantity demanded. Next is time. Because substitution takes time, price elasticity will be higher in the long run than the short run. In the short run, many a times the consumer might not have enough time to change the quantity demanded. So they tend to be inelastic. Whereas when you have time availability, when you are planning a vacation, let's say, you would be more elastic with the transport choices. So if you have more time for consideration, a cons consumer would be very elastic with the demand. If the time is not there, they have to quickly make the decision that they won't be price sensitive. Next is, what is the type of good? Luxury or necessity? Necessities demand is usually inelastic because there are usually very few substitutes for necessities in terms of electricity, in terms of medicines. These are the basic essential consumer goods. These are necessities in our life. So we would be inelastic. For luxury goods such as expensive cars, which are not needed on daily basis, there are many substitutes for such luxury products. So demand would be elastic. So here we understand that the type of good is also a very important determinant whether that particular good would be price elastic or not. So demand tends to be elastic if the good is a luxury product. There is a longer time period to make that purchase decision. There are a large number of close substitute available in terms of, I've given the example of tea and coffee, more narrowly defined the market. In terms of definition of market, for example, if I'm trying to choose between vanilla ice cream and strawberry ice cream, I tend to be very elastic. I can choose any of these products 
any of these flavors. But when I'm trying to have a broadly defined market in terms of whether I would like to have an ice cream or a cold drink, I might not be that elastic. My choice would remain the same even if there is a change in price. So that is also a very important constant or determinant of price elasticity of demand. Next is demand tends to be inelastic if the good is a necessity. So price elastic, uh, price quantity demanded would be inelastic. If the time period is shorter, if you have very short time to take that decision, definitely your demand is going to be inelastic. There are less number of substitutes available. So if there are less number of substitutes available to, let's say, my air travel, I'm trying to travel to some place very quickly and the distance is huge and the train availability or the by road transport is not good available, not easily available or at a higher price. Definitely the limited number of substitutes availability would make my choice, my quantity demanded as inelastic. Broadly defined the market, as I gave you the example of ice creams, if it's a choice between ice cream and cold drink. I might be inelastic with my demand. But when we go to a narrowly defined market like flavors and fragrances, we tend to be more elastic. These are the different degrees of elasticity of demand when plotted on a graph. In graph A, we can see that there is a 10% change in price and there is a 20% reduction in demand. So we consider this elasticity as greater than one, ED is greater than one, because the change in quantity demanded dominates and it is a price, sense. it's a very sensitive or responsive demand, which makes it changes in uh, quantity demanded. So we call this particular commodity as relatively elastic. Next, we come to graph B which is where on the y-axis, the price is denominated and the x-axis, the quantity is denominated. When there is a 10% increase in price, there is a 4% reduction in demand. So we can see that there is a less reaction or risk response from the quantity demanded. So we can consider this particular commodity as relatively inelastic. Usually we take the example of commodities such as salt and sugar where we are inelastic because they are a lower portion of our budget. Next we come to unit elasticity. So a 10% change in price gives a 10% change in quantity demanded. Here we usually take example of clothes, apples. So a, this is known as unit elastic demand. A 10% change in price has resulted in 10% change in the quantity demanded. Next, we move to the perfectly elastic graph in graph D, where a 1% change in the price has reduced the quantity demanded to a large extent. The graph is not denominated, denoted by a horizontal line. So ED is equal to infinity. These are very elastic. There are no perfect examples for such case, these are very rare case, but we can understand this with the price uh, demand for gold and shares or even a tiny change in the price of share prices to some pesa or something. So people have huge impact on the quantity demand and they are very sensitive. Next is price perfectly inelastic. So 10% change in price has not impacted the quantity demanded. It is denoted by ED is equal to zero. So there is no change in the quantity demanded. Here we can consider the life-saving drugs or important medicines. Even a change in price would not impact the quantity demanded. So these five graphs, depending upon the slope of the graph, we can understand the degree of elasticity of demand for such products. So graph A, B, C, D, and E denote the different kind of elasticity of demand. So what is the relationship between price and total revenue? Total revenue is the price of a good multiplied by the quantity sold. So when elastic demand, a small increase in price leads to a big decrease in the quantity demanded. Total revenue will decrease when the price increases because the quantity demanded has gone down. So P and Q decreases 
when P rises. In case of elastic demand, there is a huge impact on the quantity demanded of a commodity. So price increase will dominate and the total revenue will decrease when the price rises. Next, we come to inelastic demand. When with inelastic demand, an increase in price leads to a very small decrease in quantity demanded. The total revenue increases when price increase. So P and Q would increase when the price goes up because the quantity is not responding. So the price change will dominate and there would be a positive impact in terms of revenue. Cross elasticity of demand, it measures the responsiveness in the quantity demanded of one good to the changes in price of another good. So here we can understand the change in price of T, how would it impact the change in quantity demanded of coffee? So what we are doing, we are trying to compare the two commodities. It is defined as a percentage change in the quantity demanded of one good divided by the percentage change in price of another good. This concept is often used to determine whether two goods are close substitutes or complements and the degree to which one good is a complement or a substitute for another. So cross elasticity of demand is a measurement of understanding whether the two goods are substitutes or complements. The measure of responsiveness of demand for a commodity to the changes in price of its substitutes and complementary goods. The formula here is E is equal to proportionate change in demand for T divided by proportionate change in price of coffee. So if you see here, we are understanding the quantity demanded of one commodity vis-a-vis -vis the price changes in another commodity. For example, if the price of coffee goes up, the quantity demanded of tea should go up, right? And when the coffee becomes expensive, when the coffee becomes dearer, definitely there would be a shift of consumers to drinking of tea and there would be an increase in the quantity demanded of tea. So proportionate change in quantity demanded for tea divided by proportionate change in price of coffee would give us the cross elasticity of demand between tea and coffee. If there is a high reaction in the terms of tea and coffee, we can consider them as close substitutes. So responsiveness of demand of one good to the changes in price of a related good, either a substitute or complement is known as cross elasticity. I've given the formula here, percentage change of good T divided by percentage change of price of good Y. The goods which are components will have a negative sign inverse relationship between the two because when the price of a good goes up, the quantity demanded of its complementary good will go down. The quantity demanded of petrol will go down when the price of cars go up. The quantity demanded of ink cartridges, for example, will go down if the prices of printers go up. So in case of complementary goods, the cross price elasticity of demand is negative. Goods which are substitutes, cross elasticity will have a positive sign, positive relationship between the two. So in terms of substitute goods, the cross elasticity will be positive. The price changes with the increase in price of a commodity, the change in uh, quantity demanded of other good will go up. So quantity demanded of T will go up when the price of copy goes up. That is why there will be a positive sign in case of substitutes. Next, we come to income elasticity of demand. It measures uh, it measures the responsiveness of quantity demanded to the changes in income. It is defined as a percentage change in quantity demanded of a good divided by percentage change in income. Income elasticity of demand is positive. So whenever for a normal good, whenever there is a increase in income, in case of normal goods, higher quantity would be bought. The consumer tend to buy more of normal goods whenever their income goes up. So that is why we say income elasticity of demand is positive. Demand for an inferior good decreases as income increases because 
the in consumer's perception one particular commodity is inferior to the other commodity whenever the income increases people tend to go for superior goods and they tend to reduce the purchase of inferior goods so ey would which is a symbol for income elasticity ey would be greater than 1 and demand would be considered as income elastic. Here we usually take example of normal goods in terms of groceries, apparels, education. All this when it will have a increase in income, increase in the quantity demanded with an increase in income. EY is less than one. Demand is considered to be income inelastic or relatively less elastic. So demand is income inelastic in terms of inferior goods. EY is equal to good, uh, equal to one when the demand is considered to be unit elastic. Normal goods have income elasticity as positive. Inferior goods income elasticity is negative. So with an increase in income, the quantity demanded does not go up. Higher income raises the de quantity demanded for normal goods, but the but lowers the quantity demanded for inferior goods. So whenever there is an increase in income, the consumer usually switches from inferior goods to superior goods. So here I have shown the consumer goods with the coefficient of income elasticity and effect on sale. So in essential goods, if the coefficient of income elasticity is usually less than one, there will be a less than proportionate change in income. Advertisement elasticity of sales. The advertisement or proportional elastic, promotional elasticity of demand is a measure of the responsiveness of demand for a commodity to the change in outlay on the advertisement and other promotional efforts. So when we consider to measure the advertisement elasticity of sales for any product or service, what we are essentially trying to measure is how the demand reacts or is sensitive to the change in expenditure or outlay on promotional efforts by the company. I'll explain again that how much is the expenditure on uh, outlay on uh, promotional efforts or number of advertisements? What is the impact on the demand? How are the demand responding or uh, responsive to the change in the outlay? It will be known as advertisement elasticity of sale. Having said that, there would be some products which will be highly advertisement elastic. Their advertisement would have uh, the frequency of advertisement, the expenditure on advertisement would be having a lot of impact on the demand, on the quantity demanded. Whereas there would be some products where that responsiveness or sensitiveness of quantity demanded won't be much with the change in the outlay, with the increase or decrease in the outlay. Let me explain further with this table. Here, we have two columns. One is elasticities and second is the interpret interpretation, interpretation. So in elasticities, if E is equal to zero, we assume that sales do not respond to the advertisement expenditure. So there is no impact on sales of the advertisement expenditure. This could be due to lack of awareness. This could be because of the type of the good. So suppose there is a good like, uh, let's say, emergency medicine you, or life-saving drug. You might not be looking at the advertisement. You just buy that because the doctor has prescribed the same. Hence, we can say that there is very less impact on the sales or almost negligible or zero impact on the sales with the change in the advertisement expenditure. Next, we consider the case where elasticity is greater than zero, but less than one. Here, the increase in total sales, the total quantity demanded, is less than proportionate to the increase in advertisement expenditure. So there has been some expenditure on the advertisement, but the impact is less than proportionate to the amount of expenditure which is being done. So the quantity demanded is not responding much to the advertisement expenditure. Usually this is seen in the case of daily necessities or groceries, where people do not look at the advertisement while buying, let's say, wheat or rice. They usually go with their taste pattern or whatever they are used to buying the product. 
Next is sales increase in proportional to the increase in expenditure on the advertisement. So sales increase here will be responding to the advertisement almost at par or equal to the increase in the advertisement expenditure. Here usually amount of stationery or other things can be taken toothpaste and other things where the sales increase but are in proportion. Next, we go to the category where E is greater than 1. That is, sale increase is at a higher rate than the rate of the increase in expenditure. So, whatever the company has spent on the advertisement, the increase in sales is more than that. So, usually we see that in terms of cigarettes, alcohol, perfumes, deos, all these categories have very high impact of celebrity endorsement or increase in advertisement outlay. The impact is a lot and mostly the consumers get uh, attracted to such kind of advertisements and promotional campaigns and the sales do respond very highly to such kind of advertisement elasticity of sales. Thank you. Now we'll be studying about business use of elasticity concept. The first concept uh, we'll talk about is price differentiation. Price elasticity of demand can help a business determine whether it would be reasonable to charge different amounts in different circumstances. For example, airline prices and railway tatkal prices are example of price differentiation. We all know that there are some products which are inelastic in demand. For example, the air travel around Christmas holidays or Diwali holidays the consumer is inelastic in demand. Say they want to travel on the weekend, they want to travel by air to the popular destinations around those holidays. So we call these uh, demands as inelastic demand because even with an increase in price, the demand would not fluctuate. So there is an inelasticity of demand which is happening there. And airline travel or railway travel uh, services understand this inelasticity of demand and that is why they can hike their prices, they can increase their prices around this time and still be very sure of the demand which the consumer will continue with. Similarly here example of uh, the food prices inside a cinema hall or water bottle prices inside an entertainment park can be taken into consideration. Here, the producer or the seller of these services or products knows the person who is inside a cinema hall or entertainment park is not allowed to carry food and water from outside. So there is an inelastic demand when you are there for the whole day inside the entertainment park. You need to have that bottled water, which is then three times priced in that particular location. And you still pay that price. That is known as price discrimination. The basic idea or the concept behind this price discrimination is inelasticity of the consumer's demand in that particular location. So this is a very good example of price elasticity used in business case. Similarly, taxation is one more example which can be understood with the help of elasticity. Elasticity of demand can be useful if a business wants to know whether they should accommodate for the cost of additional taxes when setting price for their products. Products such as alcohol and tobacco, for example, are often taxed as they have inelastic demand. So we all know because of habitual use and because of addiction, alcohol and tobacco products have inelastic demand. That is, with the increase in price, there is no change in the consumer demand for these products. So quantity demanded for these products remain the same. They are not sensitive to the changes or increase in prices. That is why the government decides to have taxation on levy taxes on these products and due to inelastic demand the quantity demanded remains almost the same and the total revenue goes up. So this is again one more example of business use of price elasticity of demand which is taxation of the product and such cases. Next we understand the determination of price the elasticity of demand for a product is the basis of price discrimination. If the demand for a product is inelastic, the producer can charge high price for it, whereas for an elastic demand, he will charge low prices. For example, there is a product which has multiple substitutes 
or is a very small portion of your budget, in that case, your demand for that particular product will be elastic. So the producer would not be able to charge a very high price for that particular commodity. If your demand for a particular product is inelastic because of lack of substitutes, definitely the producer would be able to charge a high price for such product. Example could be some new products which are launched in the market, for example, dishwasher. In the, that case, the price would be high. <laughs> Next, we'll talk about the price de determination of factors of production. The concept of elasticity of demand is of significance for determining prices of various factors of production. Factors of production are paid according to their elasticity of demand. In other words, if the demand of a factor is inelastic, its price will be high. If it is elastic, its price would be low. For the machineries or for, let's say, cement uh, as a use in factors of production, the raw material which is used in making or constructing a building, if the demand is inelastic, those particular raw material would be very high priced. The raw materials which have substitutes or other possibilities, there the price would be less. So price determination of factors of production is one more example where we use the price elasticity. Next, we come to demand forecasting. The elasticity of demand is the basis of demand forecasting. The knowledge of income elasticity is essential for demand forecasting of producible goods in future. Long-term production planning and management depend more on the income elasticity because management can know the effect of changing income levels on the demand for his product. In other words, the products which have high income elasticity would be very much in demand as the GDP or national income level for any economy grows. More the economy grows, prospers, there would be an increase in income. Uh, we can take the example of India, that in India, there is a general hike in the income level of the population. And we can see that the normal goods like uh, Clothes, apparels, education, fast food have seen an increase in demand. So demand forecasting for such products can be done on the basis of how the income level are supposed to uh, react in the future. If in the future we expect the income levels to go up, then demand for such normal goods will go up. Similarly, vice versa, if the income levels are going up, the demand for inferior commodities will be going down in future because as the income level goes up, the consumer starts using more of superior goods or normal goods. One more case could be demand for luxury goods. If we understand in an economy, luxury products like foreign travel or luxury cars or sports car or antique paintings are considered as luxury products, then demand for these products will go up in future. Next, we talk about public utility pricing. Before imposing statutory price control on a product, the government considers the elasticity of demand for that product. The government decision to declare public utilities for the industries whose products have inelastic demand are, are, and are in danger of being controlled by monopolist interest depends on the elasticity of demand for their products. So the product where we have inelastic demand like water, electricity, uh, railways, the government usually makes sure that it takes care of the distribution of such utilities here, the public utility pricing is usually controlled by the government because of inelastic demand for such products. Next, we come to international trade. The gains from international trade depend, among others, on the elasticity of demand. A country will gain from international trade if it exports goods with less elasticity of demand and import those goods for which its demand is elastic. So whenever India is exporting commodities, it should make sure that 
it tries to export the commodities which are inelastic in demand. So whether uh, these products are from a handloom, handicraft or IT related goods, the government should try to ensure that the products which are being exported have inelastic demand. Similarly, when we are importing the goods, we should try to have elastic demand so that if we put import duties on such products, then their demand does not go down. So in basically, even the concept of international trade uses the concept of price elasticity to understand the import and export duties.